guys, welcome to the Jungle Room Podcast and YouTube channel. I am Jamie Kay, and with me this week is someone that I think you guys are going to really enjoy listening to. Her name is Sally Hodel, and she is the author of the new book, Destined to Die Young. And this is a book about Elvis Presley, and it has information that, wow, it still blows me away. I cannot stress this enough. This is a wonderful book. It's well-researched. It's written in a way that's easy to understand, especially for someone like me, but it is so good. Sally, welcome to the show. How are you? Hey, Jamie. Thank you. I'm great. Thanks for having me. So Sally, I have to ask, what was your inspiration to writing this book? This is a different type of Elvis book. This isn't something that you would normally see on the bookshelves. Absolutely. And it, 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 it grew over time. You know, I've always been an, an Elvis fan and I would read whatever new book came out. Um, and I think I was always, I always felt that there was a connection between Elvis's early death and Gladys's early death. She didn't take the same prescription medication he did. So there had to be a correlation there. And I think that just kind of stuck with me. I, I've always enjoyed reading about Elvis's story because of all the contradictions and all the unanswered questions um, and the mystery, I suppose, you know, attached to some of it. Um, and I love his story of overcoming poverty and really creating <laughs> who he became. Um, so I've always been interested in the story and I always felt like there was more to it. Um, as an adult, I, I just felt like there was truth there and I tend to follow truth. I want to know the truth. I want to explore the truth. So, um, I had more time because I, I have four kids and I homeschool. Uh, so they were getting older and more independent. And I just kind of thought, what do I want to do with those, you know, a couple hours a day that I have and I wanted to do something productive with it. And I had uh, rediscovered some of the old Elvis books that I had as a kid. And, you know, Elvis and Gladys was one of them. And in that book, she talks about how uh, Elvis's maternal grandparents were first cousins. So from there, you know, the connection just kind of grew. Like, what if that was the answer that I've been looking for or the connection to that initial mystery you know, of why they die at such similar ages? Um, and from there, I started researching and investigating and there was so much evidence and there was so much correlation that I really felt like I had to fully explore it because I saw truth there. And and I had the, you know, I'm fortunate that I had the, the time to do it. Uh, it was stressful at times, but <laughs> I had the time, I had the opportunity, I had the means and, and I did, you know, and I did struggle with it at first. Cause I did feel, you know, I walk my dog every morning in the woods. And I remember several mornings where I was thinking, is it ethical to write a book about someone I've never met? <laughs> and that question really stuck with me for a long time. And of course, there have been biographers who didn't know their subjects, you know, from the beginning of time. Mm -hmm. uh, but it really did stick with me. And I had to kind of work through that. And because I felt like there was such truth there. Mm -hmm. And because I felt that it was a story that Elvis himself, even as a private man who hid his health problems and hid them so well that the prescription medication he took to hide those health problems is now more known than the health problems, which I think he would now prefer to be the other way around. Right. Um, I think he would want this story told too. So really it's the, the truth motivated me. What I, what I think, you know, could possibly be the truth. And you've read the book. I, I lay it out there. Uh, it is fair to say it's just a theory because clearly there's so much that we'll never know for sure. Correct. Yeah. <laughs> That's part yeah. of the intrigue about Elvis's story. But I'd also say that, you know, all facts began as theories. So this was a, this was a valid idea and I felt like it deserved the time and the, the merit to research it. And Elvis, and, Elvis deserved it. And you did such a phenomenal job in, in your research. Yeah. And one of the biggest things that, that for me was a re revelation was the fact that Elvis's maternal grandparents, Gladys's parents, were first cousins. Now mm -hmm. I may have read that in a book somewhere, but it, it didn't stick. Mm -hmm. And that is the, the start of the story was Elvis's grandparents were, maternal grandparents were first cousins. It's, the, it's 1902, 1903, this early 1900s. It, it, it seems odd to us today in 2020 that first cousins would 
want to get married and start families. I'm thinking of my cousins right now. Gross. <laughs> and, um, yeah, Rafael Lozada, I'm, I'm looking at you. Yeah. Um, I, but that wasn't abnormal back then. This is it the early 1900s. It's country. It's, it's not, there's not that many people to choose from. So we need to start there. Um, yes. So go, so let's, let's walk me through Elvis's grandparents, their first cousins, they marry, and then the story begins. Right. And I talk about how and why that happens, because we do have to look at first marriage in historical context. I, all of history needs to be looked at in historical context of when it happened to fully be understood. Um, so I do give a, you know, quite a bit of history on the family, on the ancestry and on the, you know, what it was like in rural Mississippi in the very early 1900s, because all of that factors in, right? Like you said, cousin marriage is not typically acceptable today, but in 1903, it was not abnormal at all. And we have to remember that. And I treat it as such other, the reason that, you know, Elvis's maternal grandparents being first cousins, one reason that that hasn't been explored before is because of the way it's been talked about. So Albert Goldman is famous for having it, you know, have the hillbilly backwoods yeah. connotation uh, that I know Billy Smith has been quoted as saying he didn't appreciate. Um, Vernon was quoted, I think in 1978 as saying, you know, we were, it was insinuated that in Mississippi, we were white trash and I don't know what that means, but that's not what we were. So there have been those kind of connotations associated to the first cousin marriage, which I believe kept it from being fully looked at in an honest way. Because in 1903, like you said, it was not abnormal. Uh, consider for a moment that FDR, Franklin Delano Roosevelt, and Eleanor Roosevelt, they were married in 1905. Mm -hmm. So two years after Elvis's grandparents, and they were cousins as well. Now they weren't first cousins, they're fifth cousins. But, mm -hmm. you know, the, the reason Franklin wanted to marry Eleanor was because her uncle was Theodore Roosevelt, and he was already right. attracted to power, and he had the presidency on his mind. So cousin marriage for him was a benefit. <laughs> It was a positive thing. You know, he was going to get something out of that. And for the Smiths, where they are, you know, this these poor sharecropping communities, uh, they really are marrying based on poverty and proximity. They really don't have a lot of choices. First cousin marriage, it's probably in every American's family tree somewhere. Um, it certainly happened longer in the North or longer in the South than it did in the North. Because when, you know, I'm from Detroit and there's cousin marriage in my tree, if you go back. And, but Detroit was once farmland. You have to remember, it wasn't always a big city. <laughs> and, but cousin marriage didn't last as long here because the train came through and transportation and then factories, all of that happened in the North and in urban areas much faster than it did in the South and in rural areas. So for that reason, cousin marriage also lasts longer. And even Jerry Lee Lewis, right? He marries his cousin in the yep. 50s, I think it was 1956, 57, 58. Yep. 13 years old. Yep. That was a, that was a little bit of a scandal. And in the, so by the fifties, you know, it's becoming scandalous. Yes. But Jerry Lee Lewis was quoted even just a few years ago saying, I married my cousin and I did not expect that kind of response necessarily because it was still the norm in the Southern States of America. That was, well, I think too, she was also 13 years old. Yeah. Which that was, that's also, you know, people talk a lot about Priscilla being so young when Elvis yeah. met her, but you have to remember Elvis's roots, Jerry Lee Lewis's mm -hmm. roots, they come from a time and a place where, you know, if you look at, at the classmates of Elvis from high school, a couple of them who have been interviewed will say, I only knew him till, you know, sophomore year because I dropped out and got married when I was 15. Mm -hmm. Totally yep. normal. <laughs> like it was totally yeah. normal to get married at age 15 and 16 even in the 1950s. Mm -hmm. And I think today we lose sight of that. I, I think that you you just hit the nail on the head because th that is something I keep stressing to people because people who want to call Elvis a, a pedophile and, right, right. you know, with, with Priscilla, um, that was 1959. I mean, my grandmother married my grandfather in 1935 and she had met him when she was 14 and he was 26. Right. Right. And um, they they married a couple years later, and it was, I mean, it, it, we change, we evolve, but we can't we can't punish the the individuals for something that wasn't that was the norm back then. It, it doesn't the seem norm. natural to us right. now because we're just in a different time. 
And it makes sense why, when you think about it, because it was a time when women were not going to go to college, most, most for the most mm-hmm. part, right? If they were typically <laughs> expected to maybe graduate from high school, maybe not, and then get married and start having children. And that would be their life and their job. Exactly. So yeah. it makes sense that they would be willing to do that even before age 18. Right? Yeah, I totally, yeah. So, I totally agree. so you know, historically, you can, you can see why. And, and when you have to remember that who Elvis is surrounded by in Mississippi and in Memphis, they're all, he sees over and over again, 15 year olds as wipes. So it would not be abnormal for him in that sense to see Priscilla as a potential mate. Mm -hmm. Right. No, I agree. I mean, I, I'm not going, I'm getting a little personal here, but when I was a teenager, I dated someone who was 10 years older. Oh, wow. Um, Later, an old, not 14, not 15 guys. I mean, don't get, don't get crazy, but I I was 17, (laughs) but he was, he was 27. So yeah, that, that, that wasn't a, that was a fun time in my life. My parents were not happy about that. I'll probably put that out anyway. It's just just historical context and it's important to think of history in those terms. And I know, I don't know the, the statistic off the top of my head, but it's in my book that even by, you know, 1970, there's still a large percentage. And I want to say it was 30 something percent that pops in my head that we're still getting married well under age 18, even by 1970. Yeah. So think about that. I mean, really, it wasn't that long ago. (laughs) So that that norm has changed rather quickly. Yeah. Um, I want to go into um, Gladys Mm -hmm. quickly, and then we're going to move on to to the twins. Um, So I have read in many places, many articles that Gladys was this 42 years old, the same age as Elvis when he died. But Mm -hmm. I've also read that he was for that she was 46. So I never really, I was like, was she 42? Was she 46? And you talk about this in your book and you clarify that she was actually 46 when she died, not 42. Can we talk about that a little bit and how you came to that conclusion? Absolutely. And it's funny, you know, because I talk about with Elvis being remembered for his prescription medication problem that's kind of his fault because he works so hard to hide his health problems because he doesn't want to you know appear weak to people uh so he's remembered for one instead of the other uh because he basically covers it up lies about it so Gladys is equally as responsible for this discrepancy in her age because throughout her life she lies about her age so she kind of set us all up for that right (laughs) by being so inconsistent about the truth of what her age was. And it started when she married Vernon. There was talk in Tupelo um, that she was getting to be an old maid, you know, because she was, mm-hmm. I can't remember, she 23, I think, something in that age range when she married Vernon. Um, she was older than him. So she was already considered probably an old maid by the, the town, right? So she probably felt that herself. And then uh, he had to lie about his age for the marriage license because he wasn't old enough to get married. Uh, so she brought her age down. <laughs> he had to raise his age and she brought her age down. And I think it probably always just bothered her, you know, and who knows what the town people would have talked about. Right. But I, I don't think she liked being older than her husband or getting married at what was considered late in life at that time. Right. And uh, it shows, it shows you that Gladys really did care about mm-hmm. Um, how people perceived her. She did care about what people think. Now we get into um, Gladys getting pregnant, having twins. Um, she, you, uh, you make some interesting points and I, and I like this. Um, a lot of people hold on to this myth that, oh, it was a big shock. It was a big surprise that Gladys had twins. No one knew that she was going to have twins. And you point out that that's not necessarily the case. There's a lot of evidence that uh, shows that they had an idea that they were having twins. Can we talk about that for a little bit? There, there are, you know, there, there are mixed stories on that one as there, everything with Elvis, right? But, and one of the reasons is because it was so long ago, number one, uh, I think truth tends to die over time because the people involved aren't with us any longer. And then you know how any story is, it just kind of grows over time. Um, So I think that's part of the problem. But when you look at everything that's been said about 
that pregnancy and whether or not she knew she was having twins. Uh, some people say she knew, some people say she didn't know. So I have to, I think when we're confronted with that type of inconsistency, you have to go with what's logical. And what's logical, I've had twins. I've had single babies and I've had twins and I can't imagine she didn't know <laughs> that she was having twins. I think she had to know. Um, she, according to some sources, she talked about it. You know, she felt like she was growing faster and, and she was convinced she was having twins. Um, again, I think she would have known. I think part of the discrepancy also comes from the fact that there, there's no such thing as prenatal care in 1935 Mississippi. It's not a thing. Um, even her doctor who was called, and I believe he was called on account of complications. I don't believe he would have been called otherwise because, you know, the grandmother was there and a, a midwife was there and a couple neighborhood ladies. And those are the people who would have helped deliver babies at that time. A doctor wouldn't have been involved for for prenatal care or even childbirth, unless it was necessary. So I think complications arose and that's when the doctor was called. And, you know, maybe that's partly where all that myth comes from is that there, there wasn't a doctor's appointment every month like there is now. <laughs> yeah. You know, there's no ultrasound machine. There's, they're not even listening for heartbeat. You just get pregnant, you stay pregnant and then you have the baby. There, is, there are no doctor visits along the way. There, there's nothing, right? Yeah. So, um, I think that's where that myth grows from, but I think Gladys had to know. She had mm -hmm. to know. And then of course the myth grows and there's all that discrepancy of one baby was born and they thought she was done again. Mm -hmm. they, by that point, the doctor is there by all accounts. So he had to know there was another baby coming. Uh, this, that birth was the 919th and 920th birth for the doctor who delivered Elvis and Jesse. Um, I'm sure he must have delivered twins <laughs> some other at some other point, and he had certainly delivered you know almost a thousand babies. So the idea that he didn't know what he was doing is is not logical for me, right? So we might not have someone you know quoted as saying this is exactly what happened, but we have to apply logic to that situation. And he was a doctor who delivered almost a thousand babies. He had to know what he was doing. Right, and there's also been speculation that the doctor was not as thorough in possibly cleaning out the mucus in right. Jesse's airways that the, he saw that the baby wasn't breathing and he just passed it on to focus on the mother and the baby that hadn't been born yet. Mm -hmm. And you talk about this and your conclusions are what? Again, he, he had to know. He was too skilled not to know. And my book does do that. It does it multiple times throughout the book where it says, this is what you've been told as an Elvis fan when you've read everything. And, and this is what we know for sure. So then this would be the logical conclusion, right? And to me, the logical conclusion is that the doctor was too skilled not to know. He, and there's, there's time too. There's a little bit of time between the babies being born. So I believe that Jesse was still born. He knew that. And then he moved on to deliver the second baby. Now, as there, Elvis, there were complications, you know, there was a lot of blood loss they talk about and it had to be scary and it had to be really bad too. And again, there are no, there's no testimony surrounding that in terms of what happened in the three weeks after those babies are born, because Gladys goes to the hospital for three weeks. Right. For three at weeks. At a time right. when no one went to the hospital, mm -hmm. you know, like you couldn't afford it. No one in that community would routinely go to the hospital. They would be taken care of at home for almost anything I would imagine because mm -hmm. um, they couldn't afford it. And it just wasn't typical, right? Doctors came to your house, you had babies at home, you did things at home. And so for her to have to go to the hospital and be there for three weeks because she lost so much blood and because Elvis was struggling, there had to be some real complications there. And again, all of that's lost to history. We don't have medical records of it, but we can draw conclusions and we can look at that logically. As Elvis got older, and he started to to have health problems. His drug use also became more of an issue. Do you feel like the drugs and the health issues coincide with each other? That maybe he was using the drugs because of some of these health issues, and the fact as he got older, he we know that he was not um, one of those individuals that want to grow old gracefully. He was fighting right. it, right? Um, but he was fighting it in an unhealthy way. How do you see the drugs and the health issues coincide together? I, I see them coinciding. And I think one of the first things we have to do, which I, would, I don't think most people do, is look at insomnia as a health problem. 
I, in American culture, right? If you can get by on three or four hours of sleep at night, which I wish I was one of those people because uh, I could use more hours in the day. But if you can, it's thought of as a good thing because you can be more productive. You can do more. You can climb the ladder, right? Or whatever it is that people see that correlation as a good thing. Um, but insomnia is not normal. It means that there's something wrong. And we know from multiple reports and witnesses that Elvis had insomnia from a very early age. And it's, it's even more abnormal for a child or a teenager to have insomnia. It's, mm -hmm. it's very rare. And it's usually correlated to, you know, ADHD or something along those lines. It's a nervous system problem. Mm -hmm. So when we look, when Elvis becomes, he can kind of, he can deal with his insomnia, right? Because he goes to school, maybe he takes a nap. He's not doing anything too strenuous, you know, that makes insomnia such a difficult thing to live with. But when he becomes famous, and not even famous, but when he starts touring in 54 and he's going all across, you know, Texas and Arkansas and Louisiana, and he's on the road nonstop. At first, that insomnia is a really good thing for him because he can keep pushing it. And all the other guys in the car are like, God, I just wish this guy would sleep, right? They, they have such a difficult mm -hmm. time around him. He's always fidgeting. He's this nervous guy. You know, I personally think Elvis absolutely had ADHD, um, ADD, because there, again, so many people in the 50s would talk about how he was always fidgeting. He couldn't focus. And then he has this insomnia attached, which we know is correlated to something like that if a young person has insomnia. So when we see insomnia being his first real his recognizable ailments, not his first ailment, because we now know from this book and the research that was done that the megacolon issue really starts from birth. Mm -hmm. uh, but the insomnia is the first thing that he treats because sleeping pills are the first thing that he takes because it gets to the point in 56 when he's uh, performing in Florida and his girlfriend, June Juanico, writes about how Elvis was so exhausted. Like she didn't think he could do another show at one point. And it's also in Florida where he, ex he passes out. He's taken to the hospital for exhaustion. It's all correlated to the fact that he can't sleep. So he knows and he sees, you know, he's not just Elvis Presley trying to get all this attention for being famous. He is Elvis Presley trying to provide for his family. Mm -hmm. So he needs to go out there and do more and more and more. He has that pressure on himself. So he has to sleep. So I think he first turns to the sleeping pills. We know he's taking sleeping pills by 57. Anita Wood talks about that. Um, and I believe he was taking Dextrin before the army. Mm -hmm. You know, Lamar Fike talks about how he took Gladys's, Gladys's pills. And the funny thing, the interesting thing that my book points out is that Dextrin is still a treatment for ADD. So, <laughs> you know, you know, you don't hear those reports anymore about Elvis being fidgety. Right, all right. the time and always moving. Yeah, people always, you know, Dixie Locke talked about that. Like it embarrassed mm -hmm. her around his mother because he was always moving. fidgeting, fidgeting. Yeah, and he was um, always, and you can see in some of the interviews where he's he's tapping his leg and yeah. his leg is moving and something uh, up and yeah. down, and you see it, that a lot. Yes. And people, you know, I, I probably was one of them. I, you think, oh, he's the music is alive in him and it's just mm -hmm. always there, but you really do see some of what you talk about with it yeah. with the ADD I really do believe he did have ADD yeah well. I just think there's, there's obviously a nervous system problem there because he is an insomniac and again there has to be a reason for a teenager and even possibly a child we know he had it as a teenager that's when he started talking about it um there is a correlation there so he starts with the sleeping pills and that helps it solves his problem right he's able to sleep so he's able to keep being Elvis and then he probably takes some of Gladys's Dexedrine to keep going Mm -hmm. And then that solves some of his problems because yeah. it, it's still used as treatment for ADD. So the fidgeting and the nervous, you know, maybe that's brought down a little bit, right? And it helps him cope through that. Um, so I think it just starts in those small ways, but you have to also remember that, like we were talking about with the birth and how even people couldn't afford doctors and healthcare and appointments and all of that. Elvis really saw his access to healthcare as part of his success. So he was a guy that, you know, that took, did some things in excess. And I think that's part of the reason why healthcare becomes that for him, because he sees that he can provide it. Like he's so happy to be able to afford it. Right. Yeah. So he has his own doctor. He's proud of being able to have his own doctor and to be able to afford it and to be able to do that. Um, and then you couple that with his own 
uh, confidence in what he felt he knew with the PDR, you know, the physician desk reference, which he's always reading um, and, and knowledgeable about. So he also felt like he knew what he was doing because he knew he had these problems, right? He knew what was wrong. He knew he couldn't sleep. Later on, he knows he has these stomach problems, you know, different things, and he can actually read about them. Even in the 70s, when Dr. Nick is talking to him about all of his colon problems, he asked Dr. Nick for a book on the colon because he wanted to understand yeah, right. what was he did. Yeah. going on, right? So he was, uh, I guess we should, you know, I, I believe strongly that everybody should be their own personal health advocate <laughs> um, and not just believe everything a doctor tells you. And Elvis was doing his own research, but unfortunately that also gave him a false sense of confidence, I think, in what he was doing. Well, I think we, we have realized in um, our research with Elvis, Elvis did not, Elvis thought that he was invincible, that he was, I don't think he really, I think he believed that hype, that he was invincible and he had so much on his shoulders. I mean, he was responsible for a lot of individuals' livelihood and mounted that stress, the drugs, the health issues. I mean, that takes a lot on just Absolutely. on anyone and being Elvis Presley that had to do a lot to him emotionally to realize, Hey, I'm not invincible. I I'm human. I, well, you know, I think both things are true. And, and I, I say it all the time, like as writing this book, researching this book, talking about it, I would just find myself saying it all the time. Like it really, Elvis's story does require you to let two things be true at the same time, which is sometimes difficult. So he is this guy who sees himself as human and he says so. He says, I am human like anyone else. Um, mm -hmm. When I cut, I bleed. My life can be snuffed out in a matter of seconds. Mm -hmm. I am just yeah. like everyone else. And he believes that. He, ble mm -hmm. he, he holds on to that humanity and that humbleness, right? I am like everyone else. But then there are other circumstances yeah. and situations where he says, I'm Elvis Presley. I can do anything I want to. Yeah. <laughs> Elvis was a walking contradiction. He Without really question. Was. And that's what makes it Very so fun. Much so. I mean, that's what makes it so fun. And, and the hard part for us or anyone that analyzes it is that sometimes you do have to hold two things in tandem that are opposites, but they are mm -hmm. true at the same time. And right. that's a perfect example. He's humble. Yeah. He knows he's like everybody else. But when he feels like it, he's also Elvis Presley who can do anything he wants to. <laughs> right? I like it. That's, and that's I a like hard it. line to walk. That's a hard line yeah, to walk. Yeah, it's a very hard line to walk. And it's also very hard for the people around you to know how to deal with you. Absolutely. Because you're not the same all the time. So I, I get it. Now, Sally, I need to ask you, you know, there have been, you, you have some critics mm -hmm. that have come out and has, have said that you are making money off of Elvis and that there is nothing new in this book. I want to know, I know the, the blood, sweat, and tears that went into writing this book for you, but I want to know, what do you say to these individuals? And are you just writing a book to write a book to make money? Uh, first, no, because <laughs> I have four kids. I homeschool. Like This wasn't anything I had to do, and it really honestly wasn't necessarily anything I had time for. It's added stress to my life, you know, et cetera. And we talked about how I felt like it was true and I had to follow that and see where it led me. Um, but it was absolutely not, it was not something I absolutely, I had to do. I wanted to do it. I saw truth in it. I followed it. Um, in terms of the not having anything new in the book, you know, I did an interview where I said a lot of what's in this book has been said before. And that's true. A lot in this book has been said before, but it has never been connected in this way before. Because if you read a tidbit, just like you said, you think you knew that uh, the maternal grandparents were first cousins, but maybe you forgot. Well, because you haven't thought about it in a different way and how it would affect the story, right? Well, mm -hmm. there are a million things in this book that we've probably been exposed to before or learned before about Elvis, but we haven't thought of them connected back to his health problem. So mm -hmm. again, it's a different context. Uh, but having said that, there is a lot new in this book. You know, I have talked to several people that Really, I don't think anyone has spoken to, at least not frequently. Certainly Larry Presley, who is the son of Noah Presley. I was so excited. He's such a great guy and to talk to someone. I couldn't believe that a son of Noah Presley was still alive. He just happens to be the youngest of many, many children. <laughs> so um, he is, and just such a wealth of information because I personally believe that Noah Presley 
is why Elvis is so generous. And you, you know that you can read about that in the book. So to find that connection, uh, to find the connection of Dr. Clark's, Clark's daughter, Nancy, I spoke extensively with her. And she, I mean, just crazy findings that I think are so important because Dr. Clark was Gladys's cardiologist. And Nancy, his daughter, would go along on the house calls. So we know from her that Gladys started seeing a cardiologist when they lived at the Audubon house. Yeah. And, and that Elvis called the cardiologist directly to say, my mother's been referred and I wanna make an appointment. And there's a funny story that goes along with that in the book, but that's so important because we've all been under this misnomer that Gladys moves to Graceland, gets depressed and dies. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> It's just not accurate in any way, shape, or form. But since discovering that she was already seeing a cardiologist at the Audubon House in 1956, that tells us a lot. And it also tells us that Elvis and Vernon were very clear on how sick Gladys was. Mm -hmm. It was not a big surprise. <laughs> it was not a big unknown. They kept it private. And that's why it's always been written as this big unknown and all of a sudden she fell ill, et cetera. But they kept it private. They kept it amongst the three of them. She had serious problems and it was as early as the Audubon house. And we, I uncovered that. Same thing with Elvis's megacolon. You know, there's always been the discrepancy that it was caused by drug use. Well, I have found, you know, testimony from 1930s, 1940s Tupelo that it was a problem for him there. And that's mm -hmm. the earliest witness testimony we have of his colon problems. So all of these things started early. They were all there. We have witnesses of it. And when you start to connect all those dots differently, it leads us to a totally different place. Question about the, the you know, make money off of Elvis part. <laughs> Just the six trips to Tupelo and Memphis, that's a ton of investment, you know, a ton of cost. Um, I funded all of this on my own. And then the hours, you know, I took time away from my kids, which is just priceless <laughs> to do this because I believed in it. So it's, it's just so not correlated to that. Success for this project is not correlated to it being profitable. I, between layout and design and editing and publishing and all the travel and the research and the hours, you know, it's thousands of dollars invested in this. And if I were to ever make it back, that would be great. But I have no, <laughs> no way of knowing if that would happen. Um, and it would take a whole lot for it to happen. So that was never part of the agenda. And I know that's hard for people to understand. If you haven't written a book, you don't understand the time and the resources that have to go into it. But it's it's a it was harder than even I thought it would be. And I've done a lot of writing. So it is definitely a labor of love. For sure. For sure. So I have to I have to point out something to you. And I'm sure a lot of your critics have brought this up. With all of your evidence with Elvis destined to die young, with the uh, maternal grandparents being cousins and Elvis dying at 42, how is it that Billy Smith and Patsy Presley are still alive? Explain that to me, how does that work? Well, it's simple and it's complicated. And I'm, I'm glad you asked because it's, it's a great question. You know, and Patsy Presley, I'm sorry, Patsy Presley for just so you guys don't know, Patsy Presley was Elvis's double first cousin. So exactly. her, her dad was Vernon's brother and her mom was Gladys's sister. So Vernon and Vester are brothers and Gladys and Cletus are sisters and they, right. yeah. Yes. So again, marriage on based on poverty and proximity. You know, it wasn't always cousin marriage. It was always it was sometimes it was brothers from one mar from one siblings from one family marrying siblings from another family because the farms right. were just totally normal. Uh, one of the things that that those unions show us, and my book also talks about, is that we have two instances where Smith and Presley DNA come together. One, you know, with Vernon and Gladys to make Elvis, and with Vester and his wife to make. Patsy and they both are just they both those unions unions produce only one child, which I think is really interesting, given it was a time when birth control wasn't mm -hmm. wasn't available. Um, and when big families were needed for all the farm work and the labor even living in the city there is still, you know, much of the uh, rural type of day to day work had to be done. So the fact that each of those marriages produce only one child I think is really interesting my book talks about that. Um, but the reason that they're still alive is because genetic disease is not 100% and people need to understand that. They can't just say, oh, Billy Smith is still alive, so none of this is true. I mean, we can look at Gladys's siblings. 
So there's nine kids in Gladys's family. And I believe six of them, six, five or six die young. And it's much more common with the males than it is the females. So that's one aspect to look at. Um, and that's explained to, and I can get into that in a minute. Uh, but the other thing is that when, when you have even two carrier parents, so say for this alpha one disease, which I talk about in my book, two carrier parents, which I believe both Bob and Dal were carriers for that disease because they are so closely related, then each child has a 25% chance of having normal genes. Each child has a 25% chance of having two bad genes and even a worse outcome. And then each child has a 50% chance of just being a carrier. Okay, so that's the statistical breakdown for each child that's born. That's the risk of just that disease. So it is not 100%, right? So when we talk about that first cousin marriage kind of making the gene pool shallow because they share a lot of the same damaged genes, then you're not getting a good gene to replace the, the unhealthy gene. Um, it's shallow, but when you get one and two generations away from that and you have healthy marriages coming in, people with healthy genes that are not related, they're very, you know, they're not closely related, they're not distantly related, another set of good genes coming in, your the gene pool gets deeper again with each marriage that comes in, if that makes sense. So it would be especially true for, um, so let me explain that when a, you know, with a girl, you get two, you have two X chromosomes. So you get one for your mom and one for your dad. So if there is a bad gene on that X chromosome, a good gene might override it because you have two copies. But when you're a boy, you have an X chromosome that you get from your mother and a Y chromosome you get from your dad. And that's why they talk about X linked related disease coming from your mother. And it's so common with boys because you're only getting that one X chromosome. You're not getting the copy that the girl gets so that the good might override the bad. You're just getting possibly defective X genes on that X chromosome. Does that make sense? Yes. So that's why it's much more common with boys. But every time you add marriage into there and it's a healthy marriage with healthy genes, right? You're watering that down more. Does that make sense? Right. So with, with that said, Lisa Marie and her, uh, her, her first marriage. Say, was, yeah, I would so say Lisa Marie. already started to water down the. Right. But I, and, cause so Lisa Marie might be more at risk than Billy Smith simply because, um, Elvis would have given her the X chromosome. <laughs> right. Right. Okay. But Priscilla also gives her the X chromosome. So if, if Priscilla's gene is good and not damaged, it will override. It has the potential to override. It might not. She might still end up as a carrier. Remember, you have the 25% chance. Right. For right. 25, 25, and 50. So Priscilla's good genes can override the bad gene that's on that X chromosome for that particular disorder. Okay, so not every genetic disorder is X linked related, you know, it, it just depends. And my book tries to address that in simplistic ways that's easy to understand because I didn't want to write a science book. This is not a science book. I didn't want to write a science book, but we do have to have a basic understanding of all of this stuff to understand how that would be passed down. And, you know, like I say, we, we know that Elvis was a carrier for the, especially this alpha one. There are a number of genetic problems, but the alpha one really is tied into how Elv uh, Gladys passes we know Elvis was a carrier. We know that Gladys had a more severe form of it because we can assume she inherited two bad genes because her parents were so closely related. So, right. and we can assume that her mother was the carrier because she had lung related disease. So it's all, you know, you've read the book and you know it. Yeah. It's hard to explain I'm, it I'm all. reading it. I'm it's reading hard to explain it, it all. The second time because the first uh, time I was just trying to get through it. And the second time you have to, you really have to, it's like, eating a very rich meal like sometimes uh -huh. after a paragraph you kind of have to like sit back and absorb what you just read because it is it gets a little deep and you have to it's fascinating but I do want to ask you you know you 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 know there are people I, I've I've had people say to me when they found out I was interviewing you that they they feel the book is just very um rude and it it insinuates that you are calling the um entire smith family inbreeding hillbillies and they just that's what they do marry cousins and whatever can you clarify that for everyone watching or listening yeah. to this interview 
I, it, this is delicate information, right? It's delicate information because these are real people and this is their family history. You know, I do a lot of ancestry of, of my own research. My maternal side of the family was one of the founding families of Detroit. It's fascinating stuff. I do some of that research with my cousin and when we have time and I love it. Um, and I had to shift gears, you know, to look into Elvis's tree. So I understand how personal this can be. I totally get that. It's delicate. It's personal. It's real people. It's their stories. It's their family story. Um, so I was, again, I feel like I was very respectful of that. And we have to look at, at it in historical context, which in my opinion has never been done before. That first cousin marriage has never been looked at as a, in historical context, which again, like we already talked about, it does not make, it's not abnormal in 1903. <laughs> Even the Roosevelt's are getting married in 1905. It's not abnormal. And it's so important to remember that. And to me, that takes away the stigma. If you think about it in that time frame. Um, there were consequences to that marriage. And I don't think we should ignore them. They definitely impacted Gladys. They definitely impacted her siblings. I don't know how you can look at that, at those siblings and see the ages that they died at and how they died. And the fact that they're all, all the males and Gladys, Gladys is just one of the unlucky girls who gets those bad genes. Uh, Cause it is possible for females too, just not as likely as the males. But when you look at all those males having heart attacks in their forties and stroke and mm -hmm. three of them dying in their forties, you can't mm -hmm. ignore that considering that the same thing happened to Gladys and the same thing happened to Elvis. So. I'm just correlating it. I'm trying to point out what I believe to be some truth. Um, and it was always my goal to do it respectfully, respectfully for everyone involved, but especially for Elvis, because one of the reasons I wanted to write this book is I just feel like he's been robbed of his humanity <laughs> in so many ways. I, he is this great man. If we don't do this to other great men, we don't do this to Henry Ford who gave us the car. We don't do this to Thomas Edison, you know, with the light bulb. We don't yeah. do this kind of negative, tear him apart for, even though he gave us so much thing, mm -hmm. you know, that we have done to Elvis. And, and the reason is, in my opinion, is he's over time become just an image for right. many, many people, especially for non-fans, right? Cause they, Elvis is recognizable by everyone. Mm -hmm. um, and in that sense, he's almost less human, right? Because it's just his image for yeah. many, many people. So I wanted to restore an aspect of that. And by showing his weaknesses, we really show his humanity. And I, I think right. that's, I think that's important. I, I, think, that's I think that is very important. And, you know, for individuals that have not read the book, I have to ask the question, did you reach out to any individuals in the Smith family when you were writing this book? I, I did. And uh, they knew I was writing it and you know, I talked with Danny quite a bit and and super nice and super polite but I, I just got the feeling that the Smiths don't do a whole lot of interviews anymore just generally speaking and that this one might not be one that they would want to delve into necessarily. Um, I have friends who are good friends with them and I could have pushed it but I chose to be respectful in that too. In my opinion I think the Smiths are people who I'm going to send the book to and I want them to read it and I want to know what they think. I want to hear their response, you know, whether it's good, bad, indifferent, I would like to know um, what they think because they lived it. So have, have, you prepared, have you prepared yourself for when this book comes out, when it is on the bookshelves and out? Have you prepared yourself for the backlash? I know you've gotten a little bit, but oh, yeah. girl, um, there's more to come, child. There's I more to come. You know, <laughs> I think so how, how are you preparing yourself for that? Because it's, it's going to come. It, it's hard. It's hard. I can't lie. You know, I, I feel like this is a positive book. I do. I feel like overall, this says good things about Elvis. It gives explanation to his why. Why did he develop this problem? That should be a question that we want answered. And I think it was Larry Geller said, you know, people are so busy with the scandalous stuff that no one stopped to ask why. So mm -hmm. really what this book does is fully investigates that question, that possibility of why, like this might be the why Elvis mm -hmm. develops the problem that he has these serious health problems. So you're right. And there are going to be people who are going to be negative, even though I know for sure I wrote it for the right reasons. Um, and I've already had some negative feedback, which is that kind this has been especially difficult just because I, no one has read the book yet, except for you and a few media people. No one has read the book. So to get the negative feedback when no one has even given it a second, right? To see what it says and see where it goes and, and just 
uh, offer it that benefit of the doubt. Like, think about it. It's a new theory. Let me think if it holds water or not. Mm -hmm. As humans, we should all go through life in that way. I feel like, you know, I think part of that just comes from being a writer. I'm a curious person, mm -hmm. but I think it serves everyone well to be curious. So I wish the curiosity was there without the negativity, <laughs> but the negativity has already been there, even though the book hasn't been read. So mm -hmm. once it's read, I welcome all feedback because that's honest, real feedback right? If you've read it and you have an opinion, that's, that's an exchange I can have. Um, like you said, there will be negativity. Um, John Rich was interviewed the other day and I was listening and he said something along the lines of, you know, if you're, you, if you're doing something that everyone loves, you're doing something wrong. <laughs> right. Exactly. <laughs> and, exactly. But I thought there's truth in that, you know, Sam Phillips says, if you're not doing anything different, you're not doing anything at all. Even Elvis mm -hmm. said, um, what in the fifties when he's interviewed about the criticism that he got, right. He says, um, you're not going to make all the people happy all the time. <laughs> right. So I keep reminding myself of that, but it, it is, you know, with social media and everything, people just have that easy opportunity to, to say things. So it's but I really know, easy. I mean, it's really easy to sit behind a keyboard yeah. and, 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 you know, just type out all sorts of opinions and, and feelings. You know, the one thing that I have figured out in the Elvis world and in just living in America, it doesn't matter what is presented evidence-wise and mm -hmm. facts, facts wise. I mean, people are going to believe what they want to believe if it makes sure. them feel good. And sure. I think when you look at it in that way, it, it's not a reflection of you, it's a reflection of them. Right. And I would encourage everyone watching uh, this on YouTube or listening to it on the podcast is, you know, you can express your pin opinion, but just be kind. I don't understand all of this meanness that is going on social media in the Elvis community. I, it's just, it blows my mind. It, it, it really does because from what I have known about Elvis and some of his family members that I and, and friends that I've spoken to they're not about that they're not about being mean and just catty and and, and it's the fans that really take it to another level and I, I don't get it at times I think that's true and Elvis has the best fans like let's be honest about that too he has uh, you know the best most committed fans and that's absolutely true uh, but I think uh, with some fans you know, they're just in a camp, right? They've chosen their mm -hmm. camp. They're, they're in the Elvis camp. They either are, you know, for or against Priscilla, they're for or against the <laughs> yeah, crew. That, yeah, like, we've talked just, about that on, on the show many times. You know, there's little clicks. There's yeah, there's, there's clicks so much the gender, yeah. And I didn't write this book from any of those perspectives. And even myself, you know, I was very conscious of trying not to look at Elvis through rose-colored glasses because I'm a, friend, a fan too. You know, right. I am a fan. So I had to kind of keep a little bit of that distance when I could as well. It's, it's a hard thing to do. So they really do just care. And I know that, um, you know, Elvis is a big part of people's lives. The people who have chosen to follow him as closely as fans do. And, and I respect that too. And I know they have their ideas and what they believe to be true, just like me, right? I was a fan who came <laughs> up with the theory. So in some yeah. ways we're no different. I would just ask that you give my theory a chance because I do believe right. it has merit and I did put the work in and you're talking about three years of my life, you know, three mm -hmm. years where this was the big thing I did outside of raising my kids. Whenever there was time, that's what I worked on. So um, I know I did it for the right reasons and I know that I did it honestly and I, I can't say anything else, you know, like that's right. all I can say. We, we know what inspired you to write the book. We know why you wrote the book, but what are your wishes for this book as it's being published, when it's published? What are you looking for this book to do for the public and for Elvis fans in general? Well, I, you know, I've been saying for a long time that there are three levels of success for this book for me. Um, first, you know, just to have 10 people read it would be success. It means I wrote it and someone read it <laughs> because writing really is a personal endeavor. I mean, anybody who writes knows that. Like you are writing for other people to read it, obviously, but it is a single singular experience. No one helps you write it. You do it all. It's a very, you know, one person type of job, if that makes sense. And you, I know you write, so you know what I'm saying. Yes. Um, so just to have 10 people read it would have been success. And, and I know I'll meet that, that goal. Um, the, 
the second level of success, you know, I've, I've made a lot of relationships now, built a lot of relationships with people who knew Elvis and, and that in itself is reward enough, right? Like I never knew I'd meet the people that I've read about since childhood and then be able to call them friends and be able to send them a text or, you know, like that's yeah. that blows my mind. It's amazing. and such a gift and the nicest people attached to Elvis. It's just unbelievable. The best, some of the best people I've, I've known and that I've met. So that in itself is reward. So the second level of success would be to have one of them read it and say, you made me think about Elvis differently in a way that maybe I was too close to see what, exactly the full picture of what was happening. But I think you hit a lot of nails on the head. That would be a huge level of success for me. And then third, you know, the, the biggest success for me would be if I could reach non Elvis fans with this book, because I do feel that his legacy is not held in the esteem that it should be. I do think that he's become such pop culture that he's become such an image that especially for younger people, if they know him at all, and I have talked to a number of teenagers who have never heard of Elvis Presley, and I don't know how that happened, but it did, that's where we're at. Um, so if they had heard of him, it's that he's this guy with the sideburns and the jumpsuit and he took too many pills and he died in the bathroom. I can't think of a worse, <laughs> you know, historical context for Elvis Presley, who mm -hmm. gave so much, who shifted our culture in such a huge way. So if I can reach non-fans with my book and it gets that kind of exposure where a non-fan picks it up, maybe just a pop culture enthusiast or a music enthusiast, and they see Elvis in a bigger, more human way, that would be the ultimate success for this book. I'm Joey Smith. This is the first time I've ever listened to <laughs> Hey, everybody. This is Joey Smith, and I listen to the John Little Room podcast, and Jamie Kay is awesome. You should check her out. You should check her out. That sounds like my Tinder profile. Like a oh, year. Lord. Y'all come back now. You hear?